Uh, <laughs> Elvis, huh? Well, I think I have a long way to go before I start singing things like Hound Dog. <laughs> Hi there. Welcome back once again, everyone, to Cast Iron Wednesday. And very much appreciate your uh, patience here. Uh, wait, because tonight, unfortunately, was delayed for about half an hour. That was inevitable only because... Oh, my wonderful full-time job decided to assign me to a uh, call that took place between 5.30 and 7.30 tonight. So I've been uh, pretty much rushing around trying to get everything done in time. So thank you very much for all of your patience. Um, <clears throat> my yeah, Details of my job are not that important and pretty boring. What's more important, of course, is the cooking and the cast iron. Um, as you can see, prominently displayed here, we've got ourselves tonight a uh, South African poiki, which I know that's how they pronounce it, or maybe even poiji, but it is not pronounced podji, even though that's what it looks like. And it looks like maybe I can cut these... <clears throat> A little bit more. Uh, I am cutting chicken into uh, bite-sized pieces here. And yes, that is going to be the mystery meat in tonight's dish, which is labeled bunny chow. <laughs> um, this, came, this came up because I had wanted to bring out especially the uh, cauldron here <laughs> to uh, do some cooking as um, this coming weekend is, well, a, f a festival known uh, all over the world as May Day, or they also call it uh, Beltane or even Walpurgisnacht, depending on uh, which culture you're in, of course. <clears throat> and that's where you get things like dancing around the Maypole and celebrating spring, not to mention it is exactly six months before Halloween or Samhain. So I'm thinking this would be a nice time to uh, do some cauldron cooking. And that's why, again, I look for a uh, poiki uh, recipe. <clears throat> and, of course, the name of this just plain stood out when I was looking for it. And uh, lo and behold, bunny chow. And all I could think of was bunny chow. <laughs> and when I did the uh, research and looked at what it was, yeah, this became more and more appealing until it's like, okay, I've got to do this. And I think you folks are going to like it because all it really is is <clears throat> a simple chicken stew done uh, poiki South African style. Uh, in fact, it's an Indian dish with a lot of curry in it and uh, as well as uh, some chickpeas, tomatoes, and all the usual Indian spices, namely all of the seeds, curry, cumin, a little bit of cayenne, coriander, cinnamon, cardamom, you know, uh, like I said, all of the seeds that you see from India here. <laughs> and uh, when when you uh, mix it all, and when you mix it all together, <clears throat> again, we're going to do all this and put it into a stew. And then when the stew is done, as I said, we will serve it in a bread bowl. Um, let me uh, just get this into a nug to a metal bowl right now, and I think we will be ready to go here. So again, thank you everyone for uh, showing up tonight, um, especially after last week's chaos. Um, even though I know the channel, this channel is called Cast Iron Chaos, I really hope to keep the chaos to a minimum. I think <clears throat> I've had more than enough chaos over the last uh, week or so between last Wednesday and especially uh, what occurred on Monday and the uh, result of that. Namely, of course, that was getting vaccinated for COVID. Yeah, that happened to me on Monday. I had my scheduled shot. And as you can see, I'm not dead. I haven't grown three limbs or, or dropped or uh, develop mutant superpowers, damn it. Um, <clears throat> but as you also know, I posted a, a comment about that on my YouTube, and the and the responses to that have been interesting. <laughs> no, I'm not going to spend this whole time discussing the pros and cons of vaccination. That's not what we're here for. Well, then why did you post it in the first place? Because, well, number one, it's a subject that's obviously very important to me, you know, the ongoing pandemic. Number two, this, as I have said before on my channel, uh, I do post about subjects other than cooking. 
And number three, quite frankly, I like laughing at conspiracy theorists, which uh, quite a few of them have shown up in that comment section. But that is all I'm going to talk about tonight, uh, that subject tonight. Rather, <clears throat> let's get to uh, answering, let's saying hi to a, a couple of people, and then let's get down to some cooking. And that would include Fluffy Otter, Glad It's Chicken, I was concerned about the bunny. Yes, no, there is no bunny in this. I'll describe that in about a minute or so. <laughs> so, And Ruth Meow and Bookworm73 and uh, John Nathan Shopper. Bugs? Oh, yeah, no, no. No, not Bugs. No, Bugs Bunny is not going into, into this pot. Don't worry about that. No wabbit stew tonight. Let me get this boom mic out of the way here. Yeah, I've started using a boom mic, especially after last week's <laughs> confusion, and we'll see how well that turns out. Um, hello, Brian, uh, Brian Griffin from Minnesota, and hello, Papa Dan, who says, once again, hi to Jamie. Hello, everybody. Greetings from North Louisiana. Well, glad, as always, glad to see you here, uh, Papa Dan. So, and that's the loveliest little cauldron. Well, yeah, this is a, um, as I mentioned, it is a genuine South African made poiki. Well, actually, it was made in uh, China, unfortunately, and imported into South Africa. <laughs> so let's get down to um, <clears throat> business here and let's start talking cast iron, shall we? That means let's get a better view of the pot. Now that you see what's uh, been uh, going on here with the, uh, with the prep work for it. Let me bring this in a little more closely. Excuse me, please. Here comes the little roller coaster again. And there we go. That is a uh, pretty good view here of, uh, again, the way they pronounce it in South Africa, as I found out, they call it poiki or maybe poiji. Um, and yes, that has actually been corrected by uh, several people who do live in South Africa. So that is why I will be calling it a poiki. Now, this is an eight liter uh, pot or a number three size poiki, in other words. Um, eight liters is probably like maybe about uh, nine quarts or so. So it's a nice, decent size cast iron uh, cauldron here. I got this thing. Well, number one, yes, I did actually get it for the look. And excuse me one second. Uh, always forget something. Forgot to have my cooking oil handy. Turn this up a little bit more. And uh, yeah, like I said, I did actually get it because of the look. I do admit that. The look is very appealing, and these things are quite popular, especially because they do resemble the design of the old medieval cauldrons. But in fact, this is Asian wood. Um, yeah, in fact, the uh, most famous and unfortunately last uh, local African maker of these uh, poikis uh, was a company called Falkirk, who regrettably went out of business sometime just around the early 2000s, unfortunately. Uh, they were located in South Africa, um, but uh, in the last few years of their business, because of financial troubles, boy, that sounds familiar, they relocated to Zimbabwe, but did not survive and unfortunately have uh, since uh, gone out of business. So those of anyone who might be watching this, or really anybody who owns a uh, poiki pot uh, with the label Falkirk on it, well, you've got yourself a vintage collector's item. I guess you might say Falkirk was the Wagner or the Griswold of uh, South Africa. So, <laughs> so in that case, enjoy. However, nonetheless, these... Uh, these <clears throat> Our cast iron pots are still very popular there. And this one is by a brand called, oh, that's hot. By a brand called Best Duty. Oh, damn, that's hot. Ah, I should not have done that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, who are probably the most uh, popular maker of those, uh, of those pots in uh, South Africa. Anyway, um, so as I said, they, uh, in, South, in uh, South Africa and indeed across all of, all of Africa, in fact, these things, as I said, are very popular, especially for doing a type of cooking which they call poikikos or poikikos. 
uh, which actually stands for basically it's a form of Dutch oven cooking, but a specific kind of Dutch oven cooking in that the way poikikos works is you uh, get all your ingredients together. You set up the uh, poiki around the fire. And this is important. Everybody stands around the poiki as the, uh, as the food slow cooks and they enjoy themselves and drink beer. That is poikikos. And yeah, the beer is an important part of it. Sounds good to me, if you ask me. <laughs> anyway, we are just uh, brown. We are just uh, searing up uh, about uh, two, yeah, you know, about two pounds of chicken here, which have been uh, cut into bite-sized pieces. And a lot of these poiki recipes are pretty similar in this in this respect. In that, we'll be adding some tomatoes and uh, our spices and onions, and also some chickpeas and potatoes. And then from there, we're going to cover it with broth and stew it up, which comes to the uh, other part, namely the bunny chow part. Now, that is another little uh, piece of uh, pop culture there in South Africa, one that I think really should be spread here to, um, to uh, America. <laughs> now, bunny... <clears throat> Um, like a lot of these urban legends, there are debates on how the word, how it became to be known as bunny chow. But the most popular one is the fact that quite a few, um, residents of India have in fact, uh, emigrated to South Africa over the years, especially the last generation or the last couple of decades or so. And so, uh, <clears throat> a lot of these have settled in the uh, country's third largest city, uh, Dur what's it called, Durgan, that's right. Um, and from there, uh, quite a few of those, uh, quite a few of these people have uh, set up their own little businesses of doing street vending, uh, food carts, you know, street food, those lovely uh, food carts that, where you can buy just about anything on the street. And it, when it's uh, well cooked, there's, uh, it's practically magical. There's almost nothing better than street food regarding, regardless of whatever country you're in. And so uh, these uh, particular uh, uh, street vendors from uh, India, they actually, there was a name for it, and that was called Banya, Banya. B A N I A, and they and Banya was the general term known for these uh, for these street vendors, and so uh, from and so of course you know from repeating that name rapidly, Banya, 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 that eventually came to become Bunny, and so of course since you are buying food from these vendors, what else do you have but Bunny Chow, and that is the origin of Bunny Chow. So while you could, in fact, use rabbit and cook this, um, more popular in South Africa, along with chicken, of course, is lamb. That's another very popular uh, dish. But on the other hand, this is also one of those things that's universal. It has a thousand different variations and ingredients on it, and probably no two uh, dishes are alike, So you, which means you can pretty much use anything you want in this kind of a uh, stew here. In this case, I'm using chicken. You could use beef or lamb or rabbit or pork. So, um, and, but that is basically bunny chow. And so, as I said, there's no, re I don't see any reason why we could not bring this to the, uh, U S now, what else do we have here? <laughs> Bookworm 73. I will be on the lookout for one of those pots. Yeah. I actually managed to get this from, uh, Amazon several years ago, 2012. In fact, when at that time, I had a neat, no, well, I had a want. I really wanted a nice big cast iron pot. And when my, and when I got my, when I saw the uh, South African poiki, yeah, I have to admit I was hooked on that. And I probably paid more than I should have to uh, get one of these from Amazon. At that time, I ended up paying $100 for it. So uh, I was young and dumb and I'm not going to even finish that. But, uh, on the other hand, I loved it from the day I, from the day I first got it. It actually was very roughly made like most Asian cast iron with a rough surface on the inside, but I have been using it fairly often for the past several years now. And as a result, it's got a nice coating of seasoning on the inside and it is actually quite smooth now. So that's a demonstration of how cast iron <clears throat> will develop a, a smooth coating 
from uh, regular from uh, regular use. Um, so yeah, I have definitely enjoyed these. Um, they especially because they're imported from South Africa. I have not seen these, unfortunately, at any bargains, regrettably. You know how sometimes you can come across a real bargain on vintage cast iron? I have not yet seen that, regrettably, with the, with these kind of pots here. So, um, <clears throat> who's to, whose turn is it to buy the beer? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I should have even asked that. But on the other hand, well, I rarely drink. Jamie does have a beer once in a while. And I think we do have a PBR in the uh, fridge for her as well when she wants it. So, <laughs> yeah. 15 gallons? Well, no, not... Uh, uh, well, my original, my uh, actual uh, early 19th century cauldron is 15 gallons, yes. This is not 15 gallons. <laughs> Again, this is 8 liters, which comes to about maybe 9 quarts, maybe 8 and a half. But it's, a, as I said, it's a nice sized pot where again i've done a lot of cooking in this i've made a lot of stews i've done corned beef and cabbage i've done uh actually african dishes too like a ground nut stew or a peanut butter chicken i've made more than once in this dish this is the first time i'm doing bunny chow but as i said it seems easy enough so i've got certainly am uh, looking forward to finishing this up now anyway i've wasted enough time on this so from here yeah, I have to admit, this is my first time doing this recipe, but it seems pretty easy enough. So from here, we go on with our with, so, with onions, <clears throat> garlic and ginger. Here's some minced uh, ginger. Unfortunately, some of that roasted garlic I made about a week ago. Nice and easy there. Uh, okay, now it says cinnamon stick. I don't, well, actually, I do have a cinnamon stick. There you go. Yeah, I do, right actually. Here. What? It's a big tall container. Yeah, it's in the big tall container. I mean, I was going to use powdered cinnamon, but you're right. Yeah, okay, then let's just, right, then let's just throw in a cinnamon stick. I have no arguments there. That's my Yes, indeed. Cinnamon stick, uh, throwing cinnamon sticks, curry leaves, which I don't have, but on the other hand, I certainly do have some curry. That, unfortunately, I can't substitute, so we'll just throw in, it says at least a tablespoon of curry, because yeah, this is one of those kind of dishes where uh, it seems like there's no such thing as too much curry. And to that, I'll throw in just a dash of cumin, which always seems to go together with curry. And a little bit of coriander. Pretty much I'm winging it here, but you figure these are street vendors here. You know, they make these fast and furious too. So I'm sure I'm doing, I'm pretty sure they're doing it the same way. It's, it mentions cardamom pods. I do not have green cardamom pods, unfortunately. So I'm going to have to substitute just a little bit of uh, actual ground cardamom. That should be more than enough. Um, curry powder. All right, let's, let's see. Uh, chicken kind of stock. Um, okay, that all looks good. Oh, yeah, and optional as well, a little bit of paprika, which, of course, is... A great excuse to use my favorite, namely some smoked paprika. And there we go. So I have to say, it's I've got an interesting smell to it already. Definitely. All right. Now from there, okay, we stir for a little bit longer. Hmm. But yeah, we definitely have an interesting scent going on here already. Hmm. Uh, I have not eaten, an, I have not tried enough India foods. I definitely need to eat more Indian foods. Um, that is, assuming I'm not going to get tired of curry. <laughs> okay, what else do we have? Uh, we won't tell. Us Louisiana boys stick together. <laughs> Just left the church Zoom meeting. <laughs> double, double, toil and trouble, fire, burn, and cauldron bubble. Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, you are correct. That is actually double, double toil and trouble. What those witches were actually doing in Macbeth was casting a spell or a 
curse, to be precise, to uh, bring double, double toil and trouble to the uh, to the uh, subject of their curse. So yes, this was meant really to uh, cause a lot of trouble. <laughs> And actually, I'm hardly one to talk, considering that trouble is sitting at my feet right now. <laughs> Looking all innocent for once. Uh, JD Hive, John. I got frustrated at the beginning of, of uh, cooking Indian food because it seemed too oily and had too many spices to add and bloom. Well, this one isn't so bad. You know, it doesn't have 1,500 spices in it, just pretty much the ones I've done here. And, yeah, that is kind of a running joke in India, as they say. Uh, pretty, pretty much for any dish, you've got to use 500 different spices, and as they say as well, and there's a god for every one of them. So, nonetheless, after this, we go on and... Let's uh, see. Okay, let's... Uh, for the chicken, which we've done. Okay, now add chicken stock if necessary to prevent any burning. Well, fortunately, we haven't had any trouble at all with that. Uh, enough liquid from the uh, chicken is preventing it from burning. I do have it on a good high heat, though. Well, me well actually, medium high. <laughs> okay, now we add... Here's where things get interesting. We add chickpeas, garbanzos. And we add, uh, to, to, where are this? There's supposed to be tomatoes in here. Um, I miss, oh, I see it. The, the tomatoes are supposed to go in pretty much with the chicken. Okay, well, then here come the tomatoes. I'm not worried. As I said, this is a nice, easy stew. I don't think there'll be any trouble at all with the order. And finally, the potatoes. And that's just about everything. Now we're just going to uh, stir it all up, and then we will uh, add chicken broth, bring to a boil, and let it simmer until this until it thickens into a sauce. You know, it is again a pretty typical stew, and indeed a pretty typical African stew. So that's why I know there will be no difficulty at all with this, and I am certainly looking forward to it. I'll have to remember to remove the cinnamon stick when it's done. But anyway, there you go. We've got chicken, tomatoes, uh, garbanzos, potatoes, and a lot of your usual spices. There's really nothing to it, as you can see. Anybody here can make this. This is my first time making it as well, and I can already see myself making this again in the future because it's that easy. In a moment or so. Now, in addition to that, ah, Papa Dan... Your curry is opening my sinus down here in Louisiana. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and <clears throat> I'm looking forward to it doing the same thing for me, too. I have had something of a viral throat infection now for at least the last three weeks or so. No, it is definitely not COVID. Uh, about two weeks ago, I went to a wellness clinic, you know, one of those urgent care centers, to have it tested and looked at. They uh, looked at it for several days and finally concluded that there were no bacteria. It was not your typical bacterial infection, not strep or anything like that, which meant their conclusion was this is a viral infection. And so all I can do really is just <laughs> wait it out. <laughs> Gee, that sounds familiar where viruses are concerned. Nonetheless, no, this is not life-threatening. I have had an, a nagging sore throat and... My uh, ears are somewhat congested by that. But nonetheless, I have not had a fever. I've actually been checking that regularly. I have not had muscle soreness or really any other symptoms. And that's what's been so annoying about this. I do think it is actually going away, thank goodness, though. And I'm looking forward to when it will be all done. <laughs> um, okay. What? Let's see. Okay, something happened outside. Huh. Are you on Wi-Fi? Uh, video pauses. Have we paused, uh, folks? Uh, how can I find some information on my cauldron? It looks like yours, only no markings on it. Um, okay, first of all, I do have to ask here. Uh, are we locked up? Everything looks okay on this end. I am not on Wi-Fi. I, I, I am on full cable. Are we locked up? Could someone please answer? 
Uh, all good here, Jessica T. Okay, good. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, unfortunately, um, uh, Bill W50, regrettably, I'm sorry to say, the problem may be on your end. I'm sorry about that. Um, anyway, <clears throat> how can I find information about my pot? If it has absolutely no markings on it, well, that makes it pretty difficult. Um, in the U.S., <clears throat> they did make gate mark pots all the way into at least the uh, early, maybe even up to the mid 20th century. The big pots, you know, I know with smaller cast iron pans, they stopped doing gate marks by around the year 1900, but they kept doing it with the larger pots because I guess it was harder for them to make them all the way up into those days. Um, one real clue as to the age of your pot would be to look at the ears, the little handles on the side where the bale goes because rounded ears all usually indicates <clears throat> that pot may be from the later 1800s into the uh, 20th century. Uh, flat top ears were used with more early 19th century pots. And yes, this one is an exception. Uh, but then again, as I said, it does have very plain markings on it. It says plat pudgy, uh, poiky <laughs> on the bottom here. So um, that's the best I can suggest. You may want to look on the bottom. If there is a gate mark and a size number on the bottom, then it is probably one of those early 20th century pots, which is, of course, nothing to be ashamed about. It's, that means it's really, you've got yourself a nice pot there. If there are absolutely no markings at all on it, and furthermore, it's completely smooth and you know does not have these little ridges along it, and on top of that, the um, ears are have um, the little, how can you say it? They look like the handles you would see on a modern day Dutch oven. You know, they've got these little ridges as well to reinforce them. Then that might actually be a modern Asian pot. And those are actually pretty common as well. You know, Asian made jambalaya pots. Um, <clears throat> which are almost always uh, completely smooth on the inside and outside and have absolutely no markings and no gate marks at all. So that may also be something to consider. Um, anyway, peg tooth loud and clear. Thank you so much. Try some Indonesian dishes. Yeah, that's on my long list of things that I still have to do. No arguments at all there. I'm very much interested in trying foods from different cultures. Does the pot come with a lid? Actually, I should turn this off and... Uh, <clears throat> yes, it does have a lid. It has, it came with this lid right here that I am gonna be putting on the pot in just a minute or so, in fact, because I think we are about ready to add our um, chicken broth and start stewing. So let's break out some of the some of the chicken broth. As you can see, nice easy cooking tonight. I have no interest in any mishaps happening this time. As I said, I'm still a little tired of what happened last week, and I do not want to see a repeat of that. So just make sure it is mostly covered, and that should probably be enough. Since we want to get a nice thick sauce in here, I might actually consider throwing in some flour. You know, that doesn't sound like a bad plan. This is chicken broth, not water, so it should not clump up. Give me a second. I think I'll throw in some flour. As I said, this is one of those dishes that has no right or wrong, and you can pretty much tailor it any way you want. That's probably more than enough, in fact. They're here. Besides, I've done flour and chicken broth before when I made um, coxinha. That's right, the uh, Brazilian street food, which, quite frankly, turned out wonderful, and I definitely want to do on here on YouTube Live. Well, that looks like it's already thickened it. I think we may have done the right thing here. 
Maybe I'll throw in a little bit of extra salt and pepper with this as well, because I don't believe the ingredients call for that. Give me one second, and then we'll be ready to cover it. Mm, where the heck did the salt go? Salt, salt, salt. some kosher salt, I guess. Okay. Mishap, I thought the cat's name was Trouble. Yeah, you're not kidding. <laughs> Trouble has been strangely quiet tonight, though I hope I'm not jinxing it by saying that. There we go. There's some salt. And some pepper, not too much. It's probably enough. One last stir, and we are ready to stew. Uh, of course, this is the kind of stew that I find to be very relaxing, as opposed to the stewing I did in those comments yesterday on the other video. <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Now, as we said, yes, there is a lid for that. And that would be here. There we go. As you can see, this is a number three size poiki. They did sizes uh, very differently there in Africa. And here's the logo, Best Duty. So, yeah, I mean, if you get up to like a number 15 size Boiky, then yeah, you've got one huge pot there. That's the type of cauldron that is legendary and the thing that they ho hold these gigantic feasts with. So, <laughs> okay. Having said that, let's see here. Is the bottom of the lid smooth or does it have uh, drippers? Well, let's, uh, let's show you. It is, in fact, quite smooth. So it's a very simple design. There's nothing to it. <laughs> um, loud and clear, no pauses, and okay. Anyway, <clears throat> having said all that, yeah, um, as I mentioned already, this uh, Poiki, uh, unfortunately, is Asian-made, and yeah, that's the uh, situation they have there in Africa, namely that all of their cast iron cookware now is in fact made in Asia or Europe and imported into the country. Some from America, but apparently not very much. Apparently it's pretty expensive to export cast iron from America to abroad. And so that means Asia has a booming business in, well, all the rest of the world. That's why a lot of the uh, cook cast iron in Africa and in India is Asian made, even though of course in Europe, they still are able to make their own cast iron. And well, that's the result of politics and that's the way it goes. And that's uh, an entirely different subject. But nonetheless, as I said, Falkirk was the, uh, was the uh, local cast iron foundry for about 70 years or so in South Africa. And it would be nice to find a Falkirk uh, poiki with or without a lid. And in fact, I saw one video, in fact, somebody had a uh, Falkirk lid and a best duty uh, poiki. So, well, it, it's better than nothing. Definitely. I'm not sure if we have uh, any. Okay, I'm hoping now we haven't locked up. Uh, it looks like we're still uh, running with the same comments here. Let me check that. Okay, so far so... Well, it seems like we are still running at this point. Uh, again, I am not seeing any indication that anything has uh, locked up, and I hope that's the case. Uh, then in that case, going further up here, got frustrated uh, when you saw Bunny Chow. Yeah. <laughs> okay, don't have good. Yeah, that's a very nice pot. Don't have one myself yet. Well, then, well, there's always time. You never know. So we are just listening to you. Well, as always, I appreciate that. Um. 
Yeah, this, as I mentioned before, again, I got this pot in uh, 2012 when I had an urge and also a need to get a big cast iron pot. I was going to on a uh, camping trip back in those in those days, and I ended up with not just this, but uh, but the other pot that I have in my collection, which is the uh, 16 quart uh Asian made Bayou classic Dutch oven, which I've also gotten a lot of use out of. I forget if I brought that one out on these lives yet. And if not, I'm going to have to do that pretty soon as well. So, <laughs> um, as I've said before, really having at least one big cast iron pot is a good thing because you will find yourself getting a lot of use out of it in more ways than you think. If besides the usual family gatherings or cooking for work or school or church or whatever your local lodge is. Um, you can also get a reputation, which I think is a good thing for, uh, for being the, for being the guy or gal who has this huge iron pot. And that means that uh, friends and family will likely want you to come and make stuff with it. And there's certainly nothing wrong with that either. I mean, it's a good w reason why. Why? Well, that comes down again to poiki costs. Why uh, cast iron uh, is a real good excuse to have a gathering of everybody just gathering around the uh, fire as the food slow cooks and uh, having your uh, favorite drinks. So um, besides, with uh, spring here and summer uh, on the way, I can only hope we'll be seeing a lot more of that. Again, especially since the pandemic is not yet uh, taken care of, although hopefully slowly starting to wind down. So that while we can have small gatherings in our own homes, um, who knows, maybe by midsummer or so, we will finally be able to uh, do public gathering. And I'm certainly looking forward to that. <laughs> uh, Paw Paw Dan got a BSR Century number 12 uh, Dutch oven, BSR 12 inch spider and lodge number five, one notch at an estate auction. Wow, you got all that? <laughs> Boy, did you make a good score. Waited three and a half hours until they got to the last table. They had cast iron, just me and a couple of antique dealers left. Oh yeah, of course, the vultures. I'm surprised they didn't snatch it up beforehand. In which case, congratulations. Not only did you get yourself a good score, but you actually managed to uh, beat out the dealers. And that's uh, pretty impressive. So <laughs> you certainly do have my uh, respect on that one. Uh, Pegtooth, I watch a microscopic YouTube uh, channel based in Tokyo, Japan. And the New Zealander that lives actually cooks outdoors on his high-rise balcony using a lodge. <laughs> And uh, can, oh, and that's actually a good thing, of course. I mean, Lodge is uh, great high quality there, although, again, it can be expensive, unfortunately, to export to places like Japan. But there are ways to do it. I mean, it may very well have a friend who sent it to him from uh, the U.S., which would be a lot less expensive than trying to buy it. So, you know, although uh, just last week or so, I posted on my uh, Facebook page, I saw this cute little Lodge... Uh, yeah, a lodge skillet with uh, actually what looked like some anime type characters on the uh, underside of the skillet. So that would be interesting. And in th that respect, yeah, designs like that would be nice to see from lodge. I'm sure some people would snatch those kind of things up. <laughs> hmm. Congrats, Jacob Orange. Oh, Jake, not Orange. I'm sorry. <laughs> Jacob Genge. My apologies for that. <laughs> Okay, That's so far so good here. I'm um, glad to see things are uh, getting uh, pretty quiet now, thank goodness. I mean, granted, as I said, this was delayed for about half an hour or so, unfortunately. This thing's probably going to be stewing for almost half an hour or more yet. So, Based on that, I've got to, uh, well, essentially, I've got to keep uh, extending this. But that's, that's all right. Um, I mean, after all, um, okay, what else? Uh, well, for one thing, if we're talking uh, Dutch ovens and vintage cast iron here, well, fortunately, sitting right next to this, I do have another piece that I just made uh, that um, you saw that video I posted the other day of the of the uh, chicken fried steak, which was actually uh, the first time I had uh, uh, really made chicken fried steak as well. I mean, that's one of those things that I 
did not grow up with, with, again, being a northern boy here. My grandmother did actually make these things, which we just called breaded steak. And that was basically cube steak with a, uh, you know, light, uh, lightly fried, you know, fried with a just a light breading on top. And that was uh, actually one thing that we, w that we normally look forward to. But what we have here, on the other hand, is a this is a Wagner number nine chicken fryer, and actually I can see after cleaning I've got to uh, give it a quick grease. So let's turn this, move this over a little bit so that you can hear me. <clears throat> and let's quickly grease this up. This was a good score that I found at Brimfield. In fact, if you've seen that video that I that I did. About three years ago, wow, it's been three years already, where I did, where I actually went cast iron hunting at Brimfield and did my best to uh, record, to uh, film it. Uh, this was the uh, score that I made there at that time. Uh, for only $20, because it was half price, in fact, I managed to score this unmarked Wagner chicken fryer. And in fact, it's completely unmarked. It has a completely blank hood blank underside with no markings at all on it. The only reason I recognized it as a Wagner is because the Wagner chicken fryer was unique for having this round uh, handle here on the, on the uh, round hole that is, I'm sorry, on the handle. Um, <clears throat> as far as I know, the Wagner chicken fryer was the only thing that they did with th that with. So I also did some hunting on the uh, Facebook cast iron uh, sales groups and managed to find a number nine size lid also unmarked to uh, to match it. And here's the other way to tell when when you have a Wagner lid here. Wagner was the only one that did these sawtooth uh, ridges uh, underneath. So that's a very distinct marking to let you know that this is in fact in the back here is the uh, lodge uh, six quart enamel Dutch oven, which I've uh, just recently cleaned as well, and have to put that away in addition. So, <clears throat> boy, actually, it's hard to uh, find keep keep finding room for all of these things. Oh, speaking of Wagner, actually, let me uh, pull that out. That other score that I just made last weekend, and that was here. It is. Here's another Wagner that I got uh, that I became lucky enough to find. And this, uh, you may have actually seen this uh, in some. In, let me see if I can uh, pull this out so that we can get a better view of this. I've got to back up the uh, camera a little bit. There we go. And now check this out. Uh, last weekend, I finally had the chance for the first time this year, in fact, to go out antiquing in my local area. And I did see some uh, interesting sights, among which was this one at an antique shop, in fact, in New Bedford, Massachusetts. I came across this uh, interesting piece, which only had a label on it that said frying pan. But what it also said was, whoa, oh, crap. <laughs> I just burned my, um, I just burned my uh, glove here. Fortunately, this is a dollar store one, so nothing, nothing bad there. Anyway, as I was saying, this thing here also had a uh, price tag on it of five dollars. Well, needless to say, regardless of whether or not I needed it, five dollars for this is something that you did not want to pass up because this is, in fact. A Wagner lid. It's not just a frying pan, although it can be. This is a lid to a Wagner double uh, fryer or a uh, combo cooker, in fact, just like the ones that Lodge sells, uh, except that it actually has a notch uh, on the uh, on the uh, on the rim in which this little uh, tab fits into, so that it can actually you can actually uh, lift it lift it like a hinge. So this thing here needs to be uh, cleaned up, but these round circles here identify this as, again, being another unmarked Wagner. So I'm quite happy to have scored this one. And actually, let me try something right now. Yeah. 
no, it does not fit. <laughs> That's because this is a number nine <coughs> chicken fryer, not a number eight. So yeah, no, this is, I mean, this is a number eight and this will certainly fit a 10 inch uh, skillet or a 10 inch Wagner, but it will not fit that number nine size fryer. Still, uh, once this thing's cleaned up, you know, by itself, it again, makes a great cast iron pan and who knows, maybe one day, uh, I might find a, uh, Wagner fryer to fit it, or more likely I may very well donate this because again, I've got a lot of cast iron. And so once this is all cleaned up, I see no reason why I couldn't just give it away as a gift. After all, it cost me all of $5 here. <laughs> Let me just put this down now. Keep it out of the way. And what do we have here? <laughs> Oh, don't forget to thumbs up and like the video. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> Any plans for a book? I have to honestly say no because I don't have the time for it. I mean, as I mentioned already, I work a full-time job and I and I want to keep putting these videos together here. So um, there's very little time for me to do all that and actually have something of a life, especially since my job definitely is full-time, as we saw tonight. So, I mean, unless some company was nice enough to give me the type of grant that would allow me to retire and write that book, which I seriously doubt, or unless I, my YouTube uh, subscribers actually shoot over 100,000 and I make enough income to really live on, which I also doubt, um, then I unfortunately do not see doing a book, regrettably. So, <laughs> Um, Paw Paw Dan, oh yeah, uh, Fluffy Otter, I have a Wagner number eight, Goodwill score, 20 years, 20 years ago, wow, I use it a couple of times a week, and I enjoy using it, but no lid, <laughs> yeah, uh, wow, I really have not seen many Wagner skillet lids, you know, that, that fryer I just showed, that fryer lid I just showed you, is probably the closest thing I think to a skillet lid, I've seen regularly from Wagner. I mean, while we do see them from Griswold, wow, this thing really, this thing really did get uh, all burned here. <laughs> while we do see them from Griswold and even from Lodge, um, not so much from Wagner. I've seen. Um, meanwhile, Paw Paw Dan's. Uh, they were the first BSR Dutch oven and spider that I've ever seen. ID the Dutch oven is century, but you have any idea of possible date of spider? Uh, both had their both had their lids. Well, especially a spider with a lid. I can only say congratulations on that. Um, if you'd be kind enough to provide a photo of the uh, underside and the lid of the spider, well, we can see what we could, can do to try to look it up. If the underside of the spider has a gate mark. And the handle on the spider has a measurement, like maybe 10 inches or 12 inches, you know, just 10 IN or 12 IN. That makes it a pretty typical spider of the uh, later half of the, of the, of the uh, second half of the 18th, 19th century, rather, possibly even going into the uh, 20th century, but more likely uh, 19th century. I mean, uh, cooking stoves became... <clears throat> popular during the later half of the uh, 19, of the 1800s. And while spiders were still common up until around the 20th century or so, cooking stoves really kind of made spiders obsolete. And that's one reason why there are actually quite a few spiders to be seen out there that have had the legs sawed off. You know, people wanted to take their spiders and remove the legs so that they could use them to cook on their new uh, wood-burning stoves. Hmm. How to send picture. Um, you could post it on my Facebook, Cast Iron Chaos. You could post it on the Cast Iron Cooking Group on Facebook. You could send it as an email attachment to my email, which again is modemac at modemac.com. Um, Peg Tooth. My, my rents were fond of fondue in the 70s, and the fondue pot was an orange enameled pot with a cast iron base for the burner. I wish I had that now. Yeah, that actually does sound interesting. Um, there, uh, I know very little about fondue pots. The only one I know of to have been made by an American manufacturer, none really. 
BSR made a potpourri pot of all things in the 80s during its last few, its last decade or so of existence. I cannot think of any of the uh, regular man American manufacturers who made, uh, uh oh, trouble. It looks like he's about to cause trouble. Excuse me one second. Hey, you get down from there. Get down. Get down. <laughs> Gotta watch him. But uh, as I said, fondue pots, I cannot think of really any of the uh, major American manufacturers making one, unfortunately. So have glass, uh, James Ramsdell, have glass Wagner lids, but no cast ones. I have to use lodge cast iron as substitutes. And that really, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, lodge is pretty much as close to a generic cast iron pan as you can get these days. And, for, and anyway, it was also the lodge lids, as I've seen, will also fit Wagner skillets, which kind of answers the other question up above. They are uh, practically the same size. And as far as I know, a lodge lid should fit just fine on a uh, Wagner skillet as well. <laughs> Trouble is looking for the treats on the counter. Yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> How old is that piece? Uh, would uh, Mike Hall. Well, let me see. As I mentioned, this is a uh, Wagner chicken fryer, and it has absolutely no markings on it at all, even on the bottom. I might date it to the 1940s to 1950s because, you know, Wagner, of course, was sold in 1957, and then they changed their things around completely, and that's when they started producing their more famous and very popular unmarked cast iron pans with the uh, description on the bottom anyway. So based on that, I might call that 1940s to 1950s. This uh, Boiki, on the other hand, is uh, fairly new, more likely, <coughs> excuse me, as I mentioned, I, met, I acquired it in uh, 2012, and I see no reason why it could not have been manufactured as recently as that very same year. So almost certainly was manufactured after the year 2000. Not that it matters. I've gotten a lot of uh, great use out of it. <laughs> so, um, Belmont, um, Belmont Leon, hello from New Jersey. Hello, and always, always glad to see you here. And uh, glad to see, you know, we've got like about 70, although it's dropped to 68 uh, viewers right now. And I can't say I blame you. I mean, after all, we're already getting close to 9.30 here. And regrettably, we were delayed tonight, unfortunately. Uh, Peg Youth, I have, no, Peg Tooth. I have fond memories of my uh, rents fondue parties because they would last for leisurely hours with conversations and music from vinyl records <laughs> and no TV or cell phones. <laughs> now, those were the days, all right. Terry Sinchev, hello, nice to see you. My number 12 Lodge Camp Dutch oven fits my number 12 Lodge skillet. Yes, Lodge was smart in that respect that their sizes match their uh, Dutch ovens and their, uh, and their skillets. Uh, for a while, in, uh, for a few years, in fact, I got a Lodge Camp oven lid, especially to fit on the uh, Lodge five quart Dutch oven. And I think it did a great job. <laughs> then I ended up giving that, that Dutch oven and lid away to a friend, but I have no regrets for that. So BSR, their camp ovens do not match their skillets. Unfortunately, they are, do not, they're not compatible one with the other. And that's one reason why until only very recently, BSR camp ovens have been largely unknown and forgotten. Although with the resurgence of cast iron and BSR's um, popularity uh, coming back, <laughs> they are not as unknown as they used to be. Even so, you may still get lucky and uh, find yourself a uh, BSR pot from a uh, vendor who doesn't recognize what it is. They might even just call it a lodge. Hmm. And this is actually giving us a uh, nice uh, view right now. I don't think this is done yet, but I see no reason why I can't stir it a little bit. Oh, yeah. This thing is definitely doing nicely at this point. Maybe I might even leave the lid off, both to uh, provide a more interesting view and also to, uh, there we go, and also to let the liquid, um, you know, 
reduce and thicken this some more into a nice sauce. Although this is not doing too badly already as it is, if you ask me. So let's wait until this thickens a little more and then we will be ready to serve it. And to serve it, in fact, we are using bread bowls. So that should make it a uh, nice looking treat. As I found out, bread bowls are actually not what these, uh, not what bunny chow is usually uh, served in. I mean, it is actually served in bread, but what they typically do is cut the end off of a uh, long loaf, like French bread, for instance, and hollow it out and use it as a bread bowl in that manner. They even remove the outer crust so that the bread is, uh, is seen on both the inside and the outside. But I did not know that until I was doing a little bit more research on this. So instead, we're going to be using a traditional bread bowl. Still, there we go. As I mentioned, what we're making here is a uh, chicken stew, chicken curry, in fact, done South African style in this South African poiki, which, again, they... <laughs> They call bunny chow, which is a really nice name, too. That's why, as I said, I kind of hope this does actually take off more in the U.S. I mean, it's nice to say we're going to have ourselves some bunny chow. <laughs> smell is making me hungry. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you could smell it from here. I certainly can, yeah. Chicken curry is something in itself, which uh, I am uh, not regretting making this right now. Let me tell you, right? Mm. <laughs> looking really good bookworm the smell is making no you yeah, said that part already i want you to get smell a vision yeah i'm tempted to do so as soon as they invent it <laughs> that would be interesting in itself so it's hard to say whether i would be able to, well as i said all i really need to do is let this thing reduce a little bit more and then i think we will be ready so I'd say this should, probably shouldn't take too long, so I appreciate uh, everybody's patience as always on it. Hello again, uh, Jeffrey Boyle. <laughs> and we are down now to 61, so as I said, I can understand it is getting later at night, and I certainly do see. And uh, Mike Hall, I thought you were cooking rabbit at first. Well, yeah, I guess I'll just repeat what I said at the beginning of this video, if, if you don't mind, that is. The reason why they call this bunny chow is not because we are making rabbit in it, but you could. Uh, again, this is one of those stews that has a thousand different variations, and you can make pretty much anything in it. This one, we're using chicken, and potatoes, and garbanzo beans, and tomatoes, and onions, all uh, stewed together in Indian spices, you know, the usual seas, that is. That's curry, cumin, coriander, uh, cinnamon, a little cardamom. And But yes, you can really make anything you want in this. You can use pork or beef. Um, or even a uh, rabbit, though, as I mentioned, lamb is actually very popular in South Africa. Um, but anyway, as I said, the vendors there in the, where this, uh, came from, which is believed to be in the area of, of Durgan, which is again, the third largest city in, uh, South Africa. Um, it is believed to be based upon the Indian that's from India, that is street food vendors there, which at first were generally referred to as banya, B-A-N-I-A. -A. And so if you pronounce it, especially like with an accent, you know, banya, banya, that would eventually change it into bunny. And so we're just getting bunny. And of course, as I said, since we are, um, you know, since of course these are street food vendors and we are getting food from them, naturally you would be ending up not just, uh, having bun, not just going to bunny, but having bunny chow. And hence, that's what this is. This is not made with rabbits. It's not made to feed rabbits because rabbits are herbivores. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, that is why they call this bunny chow. You know, I could actually see, while there are African-style restaurants here in the uh, U.S., I could actually see them if naming the restaurant bunny chow or bunny putting bunny chow on their uh, on their menu. I would think that that would actually be quite popular. Although quite a few of the uh, ones, African restaurants I see here, they do oxtail. Uh, but of course, there's no reason why you could not do oxtail in this. I've got to do another oxtail dish pretty soon as well. So 
James Ramsdale, I have to make this recipe uh, to get one of my Dutch ovens to hold all these spices and keep the flavor in it. Yeah. And if you do a Google search for bunny chow recipe, they'll, you'll find it is very easy to find. I mean, again, it's a very, it's very popular. This is a street food that's very popular. And besides, again, it's a very fun name, bunny chow. You will not have any difficulty at all finding a bunny chow recipe if you look for it on Google. So uh, it looks like it should be served over rice, and there's no reason not to. Um, there is actually some history, I found out, the reason why they serve it in those bread bowls. And the history, unfortunately, has to do with the institutionalized racism of South African apartheid, which has fortunately been overthrown. Um, <clears throat> but back in the uh, days... Um, the workers would often would uh, go out to lunch and uh, look and go to restaurants and uh, street food vendors and so forth. And of course, you know, because they were colored, uh, they were not allowed to actually sit down in the restaurants. So they had to get portable f uh, food. And because of that, the uh, vendors would uh, would uh, actually do that. They would serve it in an, in a bread bowl. And in, and so they would be able to uh, just simply, if not even eat it with their hands, but again, they would be able to take it with them and just eat it right out of the bread bowl. And that's one of the things I love about bread bowls, of course. You know, you can eat the bowl too. But that's the reason why that's uh, uh, served in a, in a bread bowl. So... <laughs> Uh, I promise I'm not going to get into that kind of history and politics. I am just very, very glad, like everybody else, that I was, well, I was alive anyway when I saw apartheid uh, fall and uh, good riddance to it. <laughs> Okay, uh, it's almost too early for me out west, Bookworm73. I don't mind when the chat starts late. <laughs> oh, yeah, that certainly helps. Uh, I have a friend in Durban. Yeah, you're right, Durban, not Durban. I said it wrong. I have a friend in Durban, South Africa. He has a machine shop. Well, you should actually ask him if he could get a uh, poiki and see if you might be able to arrange to uh, purchase it from him might be a lot less expensive in that case than uh, purchasing one from, like, say, Amazon or, or an importer. So uh, might I suggest that you uh, consider that. Peg Tooth, it's only uh, nineteen. It's only 7.30 here, mountain time. There's no need to rush. This is my favorite part of Wednesdays. <laughs> well, again, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, I can only say, of course, this is, uh, unfortunately, it's a work night for me, too. So it's 9.30 at night here. So... Unfortunately, I am bound by my own time zone. But nonetheless, this is uh, looking pretty good right now. I will agree. Yes, we've got ourselves a nice nice stew already. Will you be serving this with, with a side, rice, crusty bread? A lot of times this is actually served with a salad, as I understand it. But actually, here's the thing. With the bread bowl, what they do is, of course, you have to cut out the center of the bread bowl and then what they do is they take the center and actually serve that on the side so that you can dip that bread in the stew as you eat it. Speaking of which, I'd say we're probably getting to about that time. So let's clear off a little space here. My bad, you know, got my workspace all cluttered up. And, you know, as they say, as they said in Ratatouille, keep your workspace clean or I shall kill you. So I better sure I be sure I don't get killed. Let's move a couple of these things aside. Get this out of the way. Get this out of the way. And these dishes go in the sink. Now, also, I should also apologize in that I am not much of a bread maker, and I have not been able to make these things from scratch yet. Namely, the bread bowls. So yeah, unfortunately, I you know, let me get this mic closer here. So unfortunately, yeah, I did actually have to buy these bread bowls at the local supermarket. 
not Walmart. I did go to Price Chopper, where at least they have some quality stuff there in their uh, bakery section. Yeah, I mean, Walmart has all the basic stuff, but if you want a bread bowl, for instance, you've got to go to a more local supermarket. Ah, but I am certainly looking forward to this. And thank you for your patience as I unwrap this thing. They certainly uh, twist-tied this one very well. But there we go. Now, simple enough. Uh, cut off the top. And yeah, I know this is a boning knife, but it's good and sharp, and I should point it away from me, my bad. There we go. And likewise, we carefully cut out the insides so as to leave ourselves a bowl. Mm-hmm. See, I believe most of the time they do just simply scrape it out with their hands. And there we go. Here is our bread to be served alongside it. That's one. And now for the next one. Hopefully if Jamie's watching, she will know it's getting close to that time. That's okay. All right, well, well, again, I will not force you. That's okay. I will, sir, I will serve one of these then. Okay. Okay. That means we just carefully do this without piercing the bottom, that is. Tear out the center. And we've got ourselves some more bread. And with that... In fact, since we are only going to be serving one, let's just keep this aside for her. And now we get to do a little bit of plating. Then after that, I think we will be able to call it a night. Appreciate, as always, I appreciate everyone's patience here. So we have this, and we just put the bread on the side. Actually, probably could use a bigger plate, but I think this this should do nicely. There we go. Let's move. Let's move our angle over a little bit so that we can see a little bit of both. There we go. And meanwhile, what do we have here? Cast iron is alive and well. This week alone, I've cooked crawfish étouffée, crawfish and corn soup. I'm from Louisiana. <laughs> A rack of lamb, pizza, and beet vegetable soup. Love my cast iron. Boy, your family eats well, definitely. Dirty kitchen is a happy kitchen, yeah, but unfortunately, I also have to clean up the mess. <laughs> uh, Jacob Almond. I have no worries, no worries about the time for me as well, though a work night for me here is in Tennessee. I have about 15 minutes left on some stuffed bell peppers. Oh, that also sounds good here. This is my uh, Jacob Gange. I This is my first live. Well, I'm glad you're enjoying it. That's the best I can say. And I'm also glad that things seem to be going a lot more smoothly tonight, at least. Thank goodness. Is that broth uh, brand PC? Um, <laughs> to the band President's Choice? Well, actually, it's more like uh, Price Chopper. <laughs> so <laughs> Price Chopper chicken broth, <laughs> which I have uh, no objections to myself, personally. So... Another nice thing, of course, let me pull out the right ladle here. Another nice thing about cast iron, of course, is that you can use a metal ladle, or in this case, it happens to be a uh, Chinese uh, wok ladle. There we go. Just pull out a nice big bunch of the stew. And voila. We have ourselves bunny chow. No bunnies involved. 
this is, as I said, I, I have no doubt whatsoever, even though this is my first time making this dish, I have no doubt it whatsoever that I'm going to be able to chow this down. I mean, after all, we it's a chicken curry. You know, we've got garbanzos, chickens, potatoes, tomatoes in there. What's not to love? So I'm certainly looking forward to uh, doing this. Let's dip a little bit of this bread, I think, and then uh, we'll be all set here. Mm. Definitely looking forward to this. Boy, this is hot, too. May have to let it cool off a little bit, but still. There we go. Mm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. And the curry taste. I have, I just realized how long it's been since I've had curry. So, mm, I am definitely going to be chowing down on this. No problems whatsoever. Mm. Mm. Also, time. I haven't talked much about this, and now's a good chance to show off the nerdiest kitchen tool you may ever seen. And boy, am I proud of this one! My titanium spork. Mm. So yeah, let's dig out a little bit of this, shall we? Mm. Oh yeah. Mm. <laughs> um, I think we are good here. I love drawing my stuff in pepper, but I'm not sure if I even have to. But anyway, yeah, like I said, titanium spork. Yeah, they sell these things at REI sports stores, but I got this one off of uh, Amazon, of course. And in fact, this is how nerdy it was. This was actually a present for me I'm from a previous life, and they actually uh, inscribed my name on it. I've had this now for more than 10 years, and this thing is still as good as new because it's titanium. If you get yourself a titanium spork, get the original gray metal one. They do sell them in colors, but the colors is just, are just a chrome finish, you know, pink, green, blue, and those things will scratch off. So stick with the original because I'm certainly sticking with this. Mm. I'm definitely not going to have any problem finishing this, and this is really going to help me get to sleep tonight. Oh, yeah. Mm. <laughs> mm hmm Try this, folks, please. I will. I am asking you politely, please, at some point make in the near future, make this. Look up bunny chow recipe, and you will certainly find one that appeals to you. Sorry for talking with my mouth full. And while we're at it, <laughs> Jacob Allman, we had stuffed bell peppers last night. So good, Terry Sincha. I'm going to make this for sure, Bookworm 73. I can already say you will not regret it. So <laughs> cube the bread and fry for croutons if it was served with a salad. Mm -hmm. um, peg tooth. I hope cleanup doesn't trash your night. No, I don't think there'll be any difficulty with this. I only have one cast iron pot to clean up. So we are doing pretty good here. The bread bowl is the capper. Oh, yeah, I agree there. And I'm really glad I took the time to do this. I mean, you can just simply serve it in a bowl. But, yeah, if you can, do a bread bowl. You will not regret it. I love curry and you're killing me. <laughs> Come on over, Terry. <laughs> Jacob, really appreciate you sharing the experience with us. Well, again, thank you very much. Try this sometime soon. Yes, please do. <laughs> appreciate you sharing. Thank you. Paw, paw, Dan. Yes, we do. And the best tasting. <laughs> And having said that, I do think we are getting on in time, though, unfortunately. Besides, I have to eat this. <laughs> Next week, we make bread. Well, I could give it a try. We'll see how it turns out. I, I hope you finish it off if you would ask me to help. Oh, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I, we may actually need some help finishing this off because, you know, a lot of these stews are pretty filling. And this is probably going to be part of it. So, <laughs> Nonetheless, I think we are about all set here. Let's get one last shot of this, shall we? Because this is not a bad way to end it with a with a shot of our cast iron boiki. Very much appreciate, as always, everybody who has taken the time to show up here. Uh, this one, of course, was a lot less chaotic than last week, maybe a little more mellow, and I'm actually glad about that because <laughs> I'm a little tired. It's been a long work day and a long work week. However, we've got the weekend coming up, and as always, then, I really hope everybody has, enjoys themselves this coming weekend. There's some great cooking, and especially has fun with your family, and especially 
keep safe. I'll say once again, I had my first COVID shot uh, two days ago, and I'm looking forward to a month from now when my second one comes in. I'm going to continue uh, social distancing and wearing my mask because, number one, I do not want to take any chances. And number two, the main reason for wearing a mask is really to protect others. So... I do want to do my best not to be a spreader. There's been enough trouble. In fact, if you've seen my Facebook page, you saw what happened to my own brother just, just earlier this month. So he only just got out of the hospital, as I found out uh, over last week, uh, two days ago as well. So it's real out there, folks. It is not over yet. Everybody keep safe and be careful and enjoy yourselves. Enjoy your family and enjoy your time and enjoy your cooking. Thank you, as always, for uh, watching, everybody. Have yourselves a good evening, and we'll see you next Wednesday.